So today I'll be talking about the transmission of monetary policy. So this is a, a fairly complicated topic um, and it's also a very important topic. And so today what I wanted to do, as Jackie suggested, is just to give you some intuition around the various ways through which a change in the cash rate goes on to affect economic activity and inflation in Australia. So I thought this would be a good place to start. Uh, so this picture here just gives you a really simple overview of the policy transmission mechanism. Uh, so this is a, a picture that I took from an RBA uh, bulletin article that a couple of my colleagues wrote, uh, I think back in 2017. Uh, and it's a, it's a really excellent resource if you're kind of wanting more information on the, on the transmission mechanism. And so what this picture does is it just traces out the sequence of steps that, that happens uh, following an increase in the cash rate. Now, when we raise the cash rate, the first thing that happens is it goes on to push up other interest rates that households and businesses face. So you can think of that as the first step of the transmission mechanism. Now, the next step is to think about how that change in interest rates that households and businesses face goes on to affect their decision around how much they spend, save, and invest. Uh, and you know, in the face of high interest rates, we generally think that households will uh, spend less and save more, and that businesses will invest less than they might otherwise would have. So what that means is that there's less aggregate demand in the economy, so less economic activity. And that's the, that's the second step. Now, the third and final step is that this decrease in aggregate demand then goes through and, and um, has an effect on inflation. So this is a, a very kind of stylized textbook description of the policy transmission mechanism. And as I mentioned, in practice, things are, are more complicated. But you know, this way of thinking about it actually gets you quite far. OK, so what do we know about the overall effect of a change in the cash rate on the economy? Well, what I'm showing you here are, are estimates from two of the big macroeconomic models that we run at the bank. Uh, so one of those models, the Martin model, which is the, the dark blue line here, is one of the models that my team is responsible for running, which is part of the reason why I've chosen to put this one up. Um, so if you firstly look at the, the top panel, uh, you can see that if we raise the cash rate by 100 basis points or one percentage point, uh, then according to these models, it will lower GDP by around 0.8% over the course of around a year and a half. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that GDP will fall, but rather what it means is that GDP will be running lower than what it otherwise would have been had we not increased interest rates, in increased the cash rate. Now, if you look at the bottom panel, you can see that um, a higher cash rate also acts to reduce inflation. Um, now, the effects on inflation are a little bit smaller than the effects on GDP, and they, they come through with a, a longer lag, at least according to one of the models. But you know, all this is consistent with what you'd expect to see based on the kind of standard textbook description of how monetary policy works. You know, cash rate goes up, and then at some point in the future, economic activity and inflation go down. So I just mentioned lags, and, and lags are, are really important to think about. Um, you know, this idea that it does take time for a change in monetary policy to flow through and affect the things that um, the RBA is trying to target. Um, and what that means is because of those lags, when the RBA is setting policy, it really needs to look to the future. Uh, and for that reason, that's why the department I work in, which Lucy uh, is in charge of, uh, spends so much time producing forecasts of how the economy might evolve over the, the next couple of years. Um, you know, forecasting is a very difficult and thankless task, but it isn't a necessary one. Um, you know, because we know that monetary policy has its strongest effects in the future rather than today, so we need to be kind of future-minded. Uh, so another interesting thing that you can see uh, from this graph is that these two models provide a somewhat different picture of how strongly monetary policy affects inflation. Um, and how quickly those effects come through. Uh, and that's just because these two models make different assumptions about how the economy actually works. Now, I won't go into all the details of that now, um, but it really speaks to an important point that when we're coming to an assessment around 
uh, how monetary policy affects activity and inflation, we really need to look at a range of different models and a range of different sources of data. Uh, there's no, no cut and dry answer to this. Uh, and as you'd expect, we spent a lot of time at the RBA thinking about the transmission mechanism. Um, and these two models are just one way that we think about it. You know, it's a very, very active area of research, you know, from building models like this to using highly detailed data on individual households, businesses and loans to try and identify how a change in the cash rate really filters through the economy. So here is uh, another stylized depiction of the monetary policy transmission me mechanism. Um, and it's similar to the previous one in a sense that it has the same sequence of steps, but it just has a lot more detail on each of the individual channels of transmission. Uh, so this picture is from the education section of the RBA website, which is a, a resource I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, so if we start, uh, with the first stage. Um, so as I said before, this is the idea that when the cash rate rises, that causes other interest rates in the economy to rise. And so the key point to understand here is that the cash rate is a benchmark for how other interest rates are set. It's kind of like an anchor. And so when you raise that ben benchmark, when you raise that anchor, that has a flow-on effect to other interest rates. Um, so this graph here shows one example of that. And this is probably the, the example that is, is most intuitive and perhaps you're most familiar with, uh, and that's home loans. So in this case, when we raise the cash rate, what happens is that pushes up funding costs for banks. Uh, and so what banks tend to want to do is pass on that, that increase in their costs through to uh, the interest rates that they're charging, uh, they're charging their borrowers. And you can see that in this graph in the, in the sense that the, the black line here, which is the cash rate, um, and the purple line here, which is the outstanding rate on variable rate home loans are, are tracking each other fairly closely over time. Um, and we kind of see a similar picture to this when we look at um, the interest rates that people earn on their deposits and also the interest rates that businesses face. So yeah, I think the other thing to note here is that the, the speed at which changes in the cash rate flow through to the interest rates that businesses and households face also depends on whether those interest rates are, are kind of variable rates or whether they're, they're fixed rates. And that's a, an important point that I'll, I'll circle back to a little bit later. Okay, so that was uh, the first stage. So the next step is to think about how those changes in interest rates then go on to affect the decisions of households and businesses around how much to spend, save, and invest. So there are four, four key channels here, which you can see uh, on this slide. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll just step through each of the, the different channels uh, one by one. Okay, so first we have what's labeled here as the saving and investment channel. Uh, and the idea here is that when interest rates go up, it can change the incentives of people and businesses around how much to save and invest. So if you, if you kind of think about what's happening at the moment, uh, the rates you can earn by putting your money into a deposit account at a bank have gone up quite a bit, you know, especially if you look around for a, a good deal. Um, and that's you know, especially the case if you kind of compare uh, where deposit rates are now relative to where they were you know, 12 or so months ago. So at the margin, that might encourage you to save a little bit more and spend a little bit less than you might otherwise would have. Um, so there's, there's kind of an incentive here to defer your spending into the future. Um, on top of that, as I showed a couple of slides ago, when the cash rate goes up, so do mortgage rates. And so if the interest rate on your mortgage has gone up, you have an incentive to pay down your mortgage balance more quickly, kind of everything else equal. Okay, so if you, if you kind of look at a textbook on this channel, the way they, they tend to describe it is, or they, they tend to call it the intertemporal substitution channel. Um, so that's kind of the, the fancy word that they use in textbooks. Uh, 
And the reason it's called intertemporal substitution is because it's really capturing the idea that households are substituting, they're kind of trading off between how much they spend today and how much they spend in the future. And so the change in the cash rate is kind of affecting that trade off. Um, in saying that, I've been talking about households a lot, um, but this channel also applies to businesses. Uh, so when interest rates go up, economic theory tells us that firms will reduce how much they want to invest in things like new equipment and you know, building new factories and things like that. Uh, and that really reflects two things. So one is that it might be harder to justify going ahead with a, a big new investment project if the cost of funding that project using debt has gone up. Um, that's, you know, think of it like the returns on that investment are, are lower in a sense. But the other is that when firms are deciding whether or not to invest, uh, something that they, they really think hard about is how much demand will be uh, for their product in the future. So you know, there's no point building a, a brand new factory if there's going to be no one around to buy the, the output from that factory in a couple of years' time. And so when interest rates are rising, firms are going to factor in the effect that that will have on demand in the future. And so if interest rates are rising, that might lead at least some firms to postpone or cancel some of the investment that they, they might have otherwise done. Now, one of the interesting things about this saving and investment or intertemporal substitution channel is that many textbooks and many macroeconomic models really give this channel a lot of prominence. Um, you know, it's often the first one that they talk about um, and, you know, the one with the most extensive discussion. But, you know, in reality, the, the evidence for this particular channel, it is a little bit mixed. So firstly, when you think about firms, um, you know, the RBA goes out and speaks to firms a lot through its liaison program, which is a program that Jackie actually set up a while ago. Um, and what our... Uh, what are many of our contacts tell us is that the, the hurdle rates that they use to decide on whether to proceed with an investment project or not, uh, which is a key, you know, key determinant of whether they go ahead with it, uh, those hurdle rates don't actually change much when we change interest rates. So that's you know, somewhat surprising. And you know, I, there's kind of lots of details here that I won't kind of have time to cover. But what it suggests is that um, you know, maybe investment is less sensitive to interest rates than many textbooks make out uh, because of this interesting feature in the way that firms make their investment decisions. And in saying that, uh, interest rates still matter a lot for investment because interest rates affect demand and demand matters for investment. So there's, there's still an investment channel, it's just maybe a bit different to how some of the textbooks make out. Uh, even on the household sides, the evidence on this uh, intertemporal substitution channel is a little bit thin. But in the case of households, that's more a case that we just don't really have the kind of data that we need to really convincingly pin down this particular channel. So it could be strong or it could be weak. We just, we just don't really know. You know. I think that data may come one day, but at the moment, uh, it's just not really there. So you know, theory says it's important, but there's a, a little bit of a question mark around that one. But uh, there is one part of the economy where there is very strong evidence for an investment channel, uh, and that's investment in housing. Uh, and when I say investment in housing, I don't mean bidding for a house at an auction. Uh, what I mean is constructing new homes or uh, doing renovations on existing homes. So investment in housing is one of the most, if not the most, interest-sensitive interest components of GDP. Um, and you can, you can kind of get a sense of that from this graph here, uh, which shows that when interest rates go up, there tends to be less investment in housing after about six months. Um, you know, this, this graph is, is maybe a little bit confusing because one of the series has been inverted to make that relationship a bit clearer. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of what it's showing. Um, you know, I, I guess the other interesting thing to note here is that, you know, based on this really strong historical relationship, um, you, know, you might expect that we would have already seen a really big decline in construction activity in the housing sector as a result of the four percentage point increase in the cash rate that, that we've already seen over the past year or so. 
Uh, but that hasn't really transpired. And in large part, that's because builders are still working through the really large backlog of projects that built up over the last few years. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, activity in the housing construction sector hasn't really dropped off as much as you might otherwise would have expected it to have given what's happened with interest rates. So, you know, the, the effects of the higher cash rate on dwelling investment, you know, they, they are there, but just maybe a bit more delayed than what we, what we might usually see. Okay, so overall, you know, housing is one area where there is strong evidence for a saving investment channel, but in other parts, the, the evidence is uh, a little bit more mixed. Okay, so next up is the cash flow channel. Uh, now this, this particular channel uh, gets a lot of attention, uh, particularly in the media. Uh, and based on the amount of attention it gets, you know, you'd, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this is the only channel of monetary <laughs> policy. Uh, now that's clearly not the case, but you know, it does have a, a big impact. And you know, this, this channel really speaks to the fact that some people are doing it really tough at the moment. And so you know, that's, that's very important to acknowledge. Uh, now, as one of my former colleagues, uh, Gianni LaCava, who has spoken at many of these immersion events before, used to always emphasize, it's helpful to think about the cash flow channel almost as two separate channels. Uh, so one works through borrowers and one works through lenders or, or savers. So for borrowers, so think uh, people with variable rate home loans, it's simply the idea that high, a higher cash rate means that the interest on your mortgage will be higher. So you end up with less cash flow, less disposable income. Now, in that situation, that might lead you to cut back on how much you spend, particularly if your income was previously a constraint on how much you were spending you know, week to week. Um, but working in the opposite direction, we also have the saver or the lender cash flow channel. Uh, so, you know, the idea here is that for people who have a lot of savings and not much debt, a higher cash rate increases the interest income that they're earning on things like their bank deposits. So, you know, their income goes up and so they might actually choose to spend more. Now, there's been a handful of media reports recently that have kind of picked up on this saver channel as well, um, you know, emphasizing that, you know, certain demographic groups, say, who tend to have uh, a lot, tend to hold a lot of savings, at least in aggregate. So, you know, say people over the age of 60 uh, have seen a big boost to their disposable income. Not, not everyone, but as a whole, then, um, yeah, incomes have gone up for that group and maybe, um, some have increased spending on things like, according to the media reports at least, holidays and cruises. I'm not close <laughs> enough to that data to know if that's happening, but that's, that's what they suggest. Uh, so, you know, the, the key thing to note here is that the borrower and the lender channels are, are pulling in opposite directions. So one is pushing spending up and the other is pushing spending down. Um, and that's just because different people are affected in different ways when we change the cash rate. So the way people often describe that is that monetary policy has distributional effects um, and research into those distributional effects is something that you know, we've been doing for a long time at the bank and it's, it's always kind of very high up on our list of research priorities. But, you know, you might think that, you know, if these, the borrower and the saver channel are kind of working in opposite directions, that that means that the cash flow channel isn't actually affecting spending. But what we find is that overall, the borrower channel is more powerful than the saver channel when it comes to the effect on saving. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. So one is that uh, mortgage borrowers are just a lot more sensitive to a change in uh, their income than savers are to a change in their income, at least on average. And you know, we're talking roughly four times more sensitive. Uh, the other thing is that there's just more bank debt in the economy than there are deposits. And so when you kind of put those two things together, what it means is that higher interest rates will tend to reduce consumption through the cash flow channel. Uh, another thing I might mention, uh, because I, I really love micro data, so data on households and businesses, 
Uh, this is one part of the transmission mechanism where we've probably learnt more about how it works by looking at really detailed data on individual households than we do by building those kind of large scale macroeconomic models. Because we can really, really kind of drill down uh, to look at you know, those people who have either lots of debt or lots of savings and see how their consumption changes uh, when we change the cash rate. Okay, um, but before I talk about the next channel, I just wanted to quickly flag two temporary changes that have acted to slow down the cash flow channel a bit during the current tightening cycle. So, you know, in, in normal times, we tend to think of the cash flow channel as working quite quickly, uh, at least relative to some of the other channels. But at the moment, it's perhaps not working quite as quickly as it has in the past. Um, and you know these two changes, they apply more to the borrower channel than to the, the saver or lender channel. So the first, the first thing is that many Australians took out fixed rate mortgages uh, during the pandemic, many more than usual, uh, because lots of people wanted to take advantage of the extremely low uh, interest rates on those fixed rate products during 2020 and 2021. So for those borrowers who did fix their interest rates, they didn't see their mortgage rates jump up uh, as soon as the cash rate started increasing, like people with variable, variable rate loans did. Uh, in fact, as you know, many people are still on the low rates that they fixed at in 2020 and 2021. But when those loans reach the end of their, their fixed terms, they, those borrowers will shift on to significantly higher interest rates. And in fact, a lot of that is, is kind of due to happen over the coming year. Uh, but the fact that so many borrowers did fix their interest rates during the pandemic, it has introduced a bit of a lag into the cash flow channel. Uh, on top of that, the, the second temporary change that's relevant is the fact that many households built up a stockpile of extra savings during the pandemic. You know, many didn't, uh, but you know, a lot did. And in aggregate, um, there are a lot of extra savings out there. So it's possible that some mortgage holders will decide to draw down on those savings buffers rather than cutting back on their consumption as their interest rates on their mortgages say go up. So if that happens, what it will do is it will delay some of the effect of the cash flow channel um, relative to what we might have seen in the past. <laughs> now, whether or not households actually do this, you know, it's kind of, we're getting some maybe early evidence of it at the moment, but it, it's a big source of uncertainty for us, you know, and that's just because we haven't really been in this kind of situation before. So it's hard to be too precise about how things will play out exactly. Okay, uh, moving on to the next channel, which is the asset price and wealth channel. So, you know, the, the first thing to recognize here is that changes in the cash rate affect housing prices, equity prices, and other asset prices. Um, you know, that's particularly the case if those changes in the cash rate were unexpected if they came as a surprise. Um, now, in general, uh, when we raise the cash rate, that will reduce asset prices. And by reducing asset prices, that goes on to affect how much households are spending. Now, there are a few ways that can happen. So one is through what's known as the wealth effect. Uh, and this is just the idea that when the value, value of your home goes down, uh, or the value of your share portfolio goes down, uh, you might cut back on how much you're spending. Um, so, you know, that could be because you just have fewer resources to spend out of, or you feel less wealthy, uh, et cetera. But, you know, there's another explanation here too, which is, which is pretty interesting. And that's that when housing prices are falling, that often occurs alongside a decline in the number of people who are actually transacting in the property market. So the number of people who are buying and selling houses. Uh, and so because fewer people are, are moving home, then you know, there's less need for spending on all the types of things that you buy when you might move to a new, a new address. So think couches, TVs, fridges, things like that. Um, and you know, there's some evidence that suggests that that's actually a, a pretty um, pretty important part of it. Now, the bank has done a lot of work on this wealth effect over the years. Uh, in fact, uh, when I started at the bank as an intern, uh, 
uh, which was a very long time ago, my, my very first project was to estimate the size of the, the wealth effect for Australia. Um, and what my analysis found and what other research has shown is that people do indeed cut back on how much they spend when, when their wealth declines. Um, now the other part of the asset price and wealth channel is the idea that if the value of your home declines, then it might be harder for you to take out a loan to, to fund any spending that you want to do just because um, there's less collateral for a bank to lend against. Um, yeah, and I'll also point out that you know, this channel also matters for businesses and there's a lot of evidence, particularly for overseas, that um, business balance sheets really matter quite a bit for the transmission of monetary policy. Okay, uh, last but not least, we have the exchange rate channel. Uh, so the idea here is that when we increase the cash rate, so when we increase interest rates, that increases the rate of return people can earn on putting their money in Australia relative to putting their money in uh, a, different, uh, a different country. And so more investors are gonna wanna put their money in Australia, and to do that, they need to buy Aussie dollars. So that extra demand for Aussie dollars will cause the currency to appreciate, which has a range of effects on the Australian economy, all of which tend to reduce economic activity and inflation. So the first thing, um, well, one of the ways that that happens is that a stronger exchange rate reduces the competitiveness of Australian firms that export goods and services to other countries. So you know, that's gonna drag on exports, which remember is a component of GDP. Uh, and also with a stronger exchange rate, it means that imported products become relatively cheaper compared to goods that are produced in Australia. So at the margin, Australians might uh, shift their spending from domestically produced goods to imports. Um, so both the lower exports and the shift towards imports will reduce GDP reduce economic activity in Australia. So you might be thinking, sure, but how important actually is that channel? Um, well, according to our big macro models, it's actually quite important. So this is exactly um, the same blue line that I showed you earlier, uh, which is the response of GDP to a 100 basis point or one percentage point increase in the cash rate. Now, in this particular model, we can do all sorts of cool scenarios and exercises. Um, and one of them is to see how strong the transmission mechanism of monetary policy is if we shut off one of the channels. If we just, you know, in this case, if we just say, we'll assume that the exchange rate doesn't respond to the cash rate. And this orange line here shows you what happens when we do that. So what you can see is that when we turn off the cash rate channel, if we say we'll assume there's no cash rate channel in Australia, uh, GDP still declines, but it doesn't decline as much. Um, and basically what this suggests is that the exchange rate channel accounts for about one quarter of the total effect of a change in the cash rate on GDP, which is about as large or perhaps even larger than the cash flow channel, which is you know maybe surprising to some given that you know, you never really hear about this particular channel in the media very much. Um, it's just not as, not as salient as the cash flow channel, but it's just as important. Um, the exchange rate also plays another important role in the transmission mechanism. Uh, so not only does it affect economic activity uh, by, by changing the, uh, the volume of exports and imports to and from Australia, but it also has a more direct effect on inflation by directly influencing the price of goods and services that we import from overseas. So when you raise the cash rate and push up the exchange rate, that lowers the price of imports in Australian dollars. And because we buy lots of stuff from overseas, like cars, electronics, and overseas holidays, that feeds through to lower consumer prices, which lowers inflation directly, you know, at least temporarily. Um, now this, this channel is a little bit different to the others because it doesn't operate through its effect on GDP, it's more direct. And so that's why this arrow in the diagram here kind of skirts around the GDP box and heads directly into the inflation box. 
So, you know, when you put all that together, uh, where we land is that the exchange rate really is quite important for thinking about the transmission and monetary policy. You know, it accounts for a sizable chunk of the response of inflation to a change in the cash rate. All right, so just to wrap up, um, you know, there are many channels through which monetary policy affects output and inflation. Uh, there's really strong evidence for some channels. The evidence is a bit more mixed for others, but all of the channels are important. And when you put all the different channels together, we see that raising the cash rate acts to reduce activity and inflation in the future. Uh, now, there are some things I didn't really have time to cover. Um, in particular, the really important role that inflation expectations play. But hopefully this presentation has helped you understand the transmission mechanism at least a little bit better.